In 1999, the People's Republic of China entered the World Trade Organization and changed the world economy forever. The exploding Chinese market attracted many Taiwanese investors, and policymakers saw a potential threat to their own industries. Foremost in these concerns surrounded semiconductor manufacturing, the crown jewel of the Taiwanese high technology industry. This video is a bit different today since I'm going to run it like a university case study. I will pose to you a question and give you some information. Think about what you might have done or decided in that situation. The decision came at a turbulent time in Taiwanese politics. In 2000, Chen Shui-bian and the DPP ended 50 years of Kuomintang rule and ascended to the presidency of the Republic of China. Just a few years earlier, the DPP had been an illegal opposition party. Now their man was in the presidency. However, like U.S. President Barack Obama, he presided over a divided government. The Kuomintang continued to dominate the legislature, and as a result, the two clashed over almost everything. President Chen campaigned on the back of a pro-welfare and pro-environment policy. He demonstrated his commitment to this policy with the expansion of the Taiwanese social welfare budget and in stopping the construction of Taiwan's fourth nuclear plant. Chen also continued the path of his Kuomintang predecessor, Li Donghui, enacting broad cultural and educational changes with the goal of remaking the Taiwanese society into something of its own, rather than just another Chinese province. Much of the Taiwanese business classes felt uncomfortable with these changes, contributing to the continued capital flight across the strait. Taiwan's economy soon began to struggle, and the unemployment rate rose to 5%. So here's the question. Up until the early 2000s, Taiwanese foundries were limited to just $50 million of investments in the mainland. This is due to a 1991 rule put in place by Li Donghui called Don't Rush, Be Patient. The rule has a nice smile but sharp teeth. Investors who did not report their cross trade investments could be fined or imprisoned. UMC President Robert Tsao would be subsequently prosecuted under this law. The question then was whether or not the Taiwanese government should allow its semiconductor manufacturers to establish and build foundries on the mainland. In making this decision, they had to consider many different factors. In 2000, two new semiconductor foundries opened in China, sending shockwaves across Taiwan and kicking off this entire debate. The first was Hongli, or Gray Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. It had two big co-founders, Mr. Wang Wenyang, the son of the founder of Formosa Plastics and the Formosa Petrochemical Industrial Giant, and Zhang Mianhang, the son of Communist Party General Secretary and Paramount Leader Zhang Zemin. These two names alone were enough to shake the foundations of the Taiwanese semiconductor industry. But then there is a second company called Zhongxin, or Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corporation, SMIC. It was founded by a former TSMC vice president, representing the first of many major cross-strait defections. These upstart semiconductor foundries use near-unlimited bank accounts to fund incredible amounts of employee poaching. This remains a problem to this day, with mainland firms offering compensation packages of four to five times what Taiwanese firms can afford to pay. And it's not unknown for these employees to bring over entire teams to China, as well as their proprietary technology. Right then, UMC and TSMC did not consider these startup foundries to be serious competitors in the market. Those companies will need years and years before developing into such. But there is no better way to kill off a competitor than in the cradle. Another factor is about cost. At the time, China's foundries had substantial cost benefits over Taiwan. Construction costs in Shanghai were 35% cheaper than in Taiwan. The water supply cost 60% less and bulk gas 30% less. Another factor is the massive market. TSMC and UMC wanted to have first movers advantage in China and take major share of the market, serving local integrated chip designers there. The Chinese market is brand new and offered infinite possibilities. Frank Huan, then CEO of Power Chip Semiconductor, said, The China market is growing. Taiwanese companies can't miss out on it. We have to be there. There's no reason that the foundry should not be there. The ranking officers in the government all know that. TSMC CEO, Chairman, and Founder Morris Chang argued this point most forcefully, saying that the Chinese market would grow 20% a year for the next two decades. China was willing to allow these Taiwanese foundries into that fantastic market, but there was a catch. As Chang said, 
TMZ's policy is to keep its headquarters, R&D center, and manufacturing business in Taiwan and to market around the world, except in some special places such as China. China is a conservative market. We need to manufacture the wafers there to enter the market. In other words, they had to give China something in order to get something. Their market for technology. Technology transfer is a sensitive subject for any nation. Taiwan would know this better than most others. After all, it was technology transfer in the late 70s that helped Taiwan enter the market in the first place. In 1976, Taiwan put out the call to American, European, and Japanese companies for the help in establishing a domestic semiconductor market. RCA won the bid out of seven companies and trained a team of 37 engineers for over a year. So essentially, the United States allowed some of its most advanced technologies to flow to Taiwan for $10 million. It was a different time politically and economically, though certainly the friendly relations between Taiwan and the United States helped. Now Taiwan faced the same potential situation, except they were on the other side. Taiwanese foundries argued that they could be responsible. They argued that they would take steps to protect their most advanced technologies, transferring over the older stuff. This would be their 8-inch wafer technology, as opposed to their cutting-edge 12-inch wafer technology. In addition, they argued that U.S. technology export restrictions would have prevented TSMC and UMC from transferring their latest fabrication tech anyway, which at the time was 0.25 micron or smaller. Yes, even back in 2003, the U.S. were restricting technology transfers to China. It was not a new thing. The last factor I want to bring up too has to do with jobs. Now I don't want to sound like a communist here, but management and labor have different goals and views on certain subjects. Management might be super excited about establishing foundries on the mainland, but their employees might have different ideas. Taiwanese employees vociferously voiced their opposition to the idea. They saw it as management's attempt to pay them less and to invest less in Taiwan. Investing less in Taiwan would mean less jobs for Taiwanese in Taiwan, forcing them to go abroad to find work. The Taiwanese Engineers Union estimated that the transfer of 8-inch wafer technology, the one that was older, would cost Taiwan 17,000 jobs over the next two years. The union vice president led a small protest of 1,000 engineers saying, We have lost 6-inch production facilities already. We are going to lose 8-inch and then 12-inch. How much more can we lose? This is indeed the real impact of losing what management calls a less advanced technology. It means the loss of people unable to have opportunities to learn how to walk before they can run. You would just instead have a bunch of highly paid executives and specialty engineers at the top and a bunch of poorly paid people at the bottom, the hollowing out of the middle class, which is kind of like how it is in many American companies. This was a tough decision. I listed a majority of the main factors people were considering at the time, but I certainly missed a few others. Because this is history, you can easily Google it and figure out how it all was. And in a few seconds, I will tell you. But before then, I would like to pause and ask you, dear viewer, how would you have decided if you were the Taiwanese government? All right, ready to go? In the end, the Taiwanese government decided to allow the establishment of 8-inch fabs on the mainland. This is with certain conditions. The foundry first had to invest a substantial amount of money to upgrade to being capable of making 12-inch wafers. The decision was extremely divisive, and it made for some strange bedfellows. DPP President Chen and his minister supported it, but Li Donghui opposed it, as well as the head of the Mainland Affairs Council, a then-unknown tying one. She said that lifting the ban on wafer investment was like releasing two tigers. Once these two tigers eat up the rabbits in China, they will come back and eat the Taiwanese rabbits. You know, to be honest, I I'm not quite certain what that means, but it sounded cool. Public opinion drifted from being 50-50 in support of lifting the ban to 27% in support, with another third saying that they did not know enough on the issue. The opening up of the Taiwanese semiconductor manufacturing industry would mark the start of friendlier times in cross-strait relations, a time that would be further supported during the subsequent administration of Kuomintang President Ma ying -jeou. For the foundries, the decision was a financial boon. In 2007, TSMC would build their first fab on the mainland in the Chinese city of Shanghai. 
Their second fab will be open in 2017 in Nanjing. Thus far, these fabs have been very successful. The Nanjing fab alone generated half a billion dollars of revenue in 2019, which basically makes it by itself the third largest foundry on the mainland. But by then, relations between Taiwan and the mainland have chilled. President Ma left the scene as one of the least popular presidents on record. Tsai cruised to a 2016 victory, and things began to change. Were the naysayers right? Did it help or hurt the Taiwanese economy? Economically, it's hard to find support for this in the data. Some sectors gained and others lost. But that's how it is for any economy in response to any situation. The data has always been extremely messy. In the end, it might be best to say that the move helped Taiwan economically and financially, but at a political cost. Many companies got richer. Improved relations with the mainland is better for business, at least in the eyes of the Taiwanese business class, and also ironically gives them the assurance to continue investing in Taiwan itself. For many econ majors studying demand supply charts in college, but not much else, that would be the end of that, right? Higher GDP equals success. But such an analysis disregards societal political costs, and both were extremely high. Taiwanese businesses continued to invest in China, and the issue got caught up in others relating to the struggling economy. Wages stagnated, house prices continued to soar, Young people kept moving to America or the mainland. The Taiwanese people saw continued struggle, which would eventually culminate in the momentous Sunflower Student Movement in 2014. Alright everyone, I'm done here. But hopefully you can leave a comment below and tell me a little bit about what you might have done, especially if you can honestly remove the benefit of hindsight from, from your analysis. It was a difficult decision, and I don't think... Uh, it was very popular at the time, but it was a tough, tough call. Hope you guys are all well. Stay safe. Have a good one.